Good afternoon, and welcome to the Voice of Wisdom. With over 60 years of experience as an investment banker, entrepreneur, investment analyst, economist, and venture capitalist, Morty Davis is Wall Street and capitalism personified. The over 400 companies for which he has raised more than $3 billion over the years have created a countless number of jobs and exciting new products. Through the voice of wisdom, Mr. Davis explores, analyzes, and debates the most topical, political, economic, and social issues facing our world today. Joining Mr. Davis today for a discussion on the 96 days until the 2024 presidential election is Len Carter. Len is an investment banker, business consultant, and private investor. And now, Mr. Davis and Mr. Carter. Welcome back to our weekly uh, get-together. My um, fabulous cohorts on this podcast, meaning you all who tune in and actually give me some of my best ideas or the the greatest criticism in the sense that uh, when I first get the criticism, I really get a little angry and don't agree with it. And then I start to think about it and I derive some greater knowledge or I modify my, my thinking a little bit or a lot. So you don't realize what a great contribution you will make to me and in the process, hopefully, in the feedback that you get as a cohort in, the, in this podcast. And then I also want to say how much I appreciate Len Carter coming back as often as he does because his time is very valuable and I couldn't afford to pay for it. <laughs> it's such a... Uh, valuable, high-priced, if, if, if I had to pay for his time, I'd have to go off the air right away. So I really appreciate it, Len. As I said a number of times, Len has a background that's really impressive uh, from an educational point of view, from a career point of view. He was... Um, a graduate engineer of Cornell University, one of the premier Ivy League schools in, the, in our nation. He became an electrical engineer. And then um, whenever he stops by the house, I'd ask him if he could plug in the refrigerator or something, because it's not working. I don't even ask him to plug it in. It's not working because <laughs> my stupidity, I, I failed to plug it in. So his genius just says, yeah, I don't have to spend $1,000 for a new refrigerator or call in some electrical guy or refrigerator expert. That'll cost me $500 for the visit. So... It's a, it's a useful career. Uh, I find it useful anyway. And uh, he then went on to get a master's. He was a graduate of the same school of business that I went to, the Harvard Business School, considered by most people the top business school in, in the United States and probably in the world along with, you know, the, maybe the University of Chicago and uh, uh, maybe Northwestern, uh, but really, overwhelmingly, it's always been considered the top school. Stanford has in recent years, and Wharton. So he was a, a graduate of the same school, Harvard Business School, and like me, he graduated with honors. I graduated with distinction, and he was at the top of his class. And then finally, before he even applied to Harvard Business School, he did receive a master's 
in electrical engineering from one of the great schools in this country, Stanford University. So by ba educational background, he's uh, just outstanding. And then the first job he took on Wall Street, well, not necessarily on Wall Street, in industry was McKinsey, was, was McKinsey and Company. That's the lead, leading consulting firm in the United States and probably in the world. Uh, they're a consultant to all the biggest, most powerful companies. So he worked there for a while. He worked for the best uh, um, investment banker considered the number one investment banker, or at least uh, one of the top three or four for sure. He worked for Goldman Sachs. I'm sure you, those of you in the stock market or have anything to do with it, stock, stock market, heard of it. And, um, and then he joined my firm, D.H. Blair, and he's been a fabulous asset. So I'm so pleased to have him join me, although he's my worst critic. <laughs> every, every show that I have, when he starts to criticize me, I get aggravated, and I say I'm not. Mar I'm, I'm not inviting this <laughs> this agitator back to, to participate in, in my pro program, in my podcast because it's too aggravating. So, like you all, who make such a big contribution and are responsible for whatever success this podcast enjoys. Um, I'm pleased to have him on, and I'm pleased to join with you every Wednesday, 6.30. Uh, before I go into the week's uh, news, which I always point out to you, is generally not happy <laughs> news or good news. It's about wars. It's about uh, uh, division caused by different political views, even between brothers and sisters, husbands and wives. Um, it's, 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 it's such enormous divisiveness in this country. Uh, people don't talk to each other. People who are best friends are uh, angry at each other for, how could you be for what's the name? And the other guy says, how could you be for it? <laughs> so it's we don't live in, in in times where the news that we cover and listen to makes for a happier environment, closer relationships, enhancing friendships. If you happen to have the same views, then it's okay. But then there's enough people to take issue with your views, no matter what they are. So. Before we get on to the aggravation of the week, the wars and, and the political, uh, I can't even list all the things <laughs> that aggravate us. So at least that would be a whole me. show in itself. <laughs> right, more than a show. <laughs> That's what life is all about. So I like to at least inspire you because you take the time to be with me on Wednesday, 6.30. I want to give you a lift. I want to add to your happiness, hopefully. And so I'd like to start off by giving you some idea about how, how to be happier. I hope it helps. I hope it doesn't hurt. <laughs> uh, which effort is epitomized by the book I have in front of me that you can see, Happiness Guaranteed or Your Misery Back. And at the bottom it says, how to be happy no matter what. And I believe it does that. And it has it's 365 pages, one page for every day of the year with humor, with, with jokes, with, with uplifting stor stories or, or uh, legends or, 
what have you, that inspire uh, a lift in how the world is at times a better place, or relationships lead to good, good things. So without taking up the whole show with my discussion of my book, I want to tell you it has made people happy. I've gotten calls from around the world, nation and even from Israel and, and cities in Europe and, and South America praising my work and my contribution to their uplifted moods. So one thing that helps would help a lot is it's easy to get depressed every day. Look, I lost my wife three years ago. I thought it was the end of the world. She was so special and such a great asset. I hate to use that word, but she wasn't an asset. She was my my life and my my, my soul. And yeah, I don't know why I deserved her. I must have got her on a day when she didn't know what she was doing or she had too much alcohol. But anyway, we were married a long time. And I'm inspired to this day. And I, I enjoy her presence to this day. Because right on my kitchen table where I have breakfast and, then, and the adjacent table where I have lunch, uh, I have a frame. I think they call it a frame, where years and years and years of pictures come confront me, appear one after the other. Funny things that happened between us, happy things that happened between us, um, inspirational things that happened with, between us. I was there at uh, the birth of... Uh, our second child, and at, uh, at that time I was very poor, so we, we got it almost for free. Uh, so we didn't get uh, such great coverage. And my wife was in the room uh, where you give birth. I forget what you call that room, maternity ward or something. And uh, I couldn't find out how she was doing and so forth. My brother was with me, and he went up seven floors and found her, and found the room she was in, and then came running down and said, Morty, your wife's in the room, in this and this room, and she seems to be going through delivery pangs, and there's no doctor there with her. So I ran up there, and that was true. My daughter, my second daughter, was on her way out by herself. So I started screaming and yelling, and finally a doctor came running. It turns out it was a former boyfriend of hers, so I wasn't that happy about <laughs> that. But anyway, uh, and then over the loudspeaker, they said, some man came to the maternity ward illegally and this and that. I ran back to the waiting area <laughs> down below on the ground floor. And fortunately, I didn't confess and they never did track me down. <laughs> but you know, so many... You're still a wanted fugitive. Yeah. <laughs> wanted From that there, day. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Good thing they didn't have cameras like that. Yeah. That, that they didn't have a picture of me. But anyway, so the way to be happy is really to have a dream and pursue that dream. Because if you live without a dream, you you have almost no no soul. No, you're not excited about the future. If you have a dream one that's achievable, not that yeah, you want to dream like I, I want to be able to sing like Frank Sinatra or Elvis Presley because my father 
hired a cantor one time to teach me how to sing and paid him significant amount of money, especially in those days when money was very hard to come by. My father worked very hard and didn't make a lot of money. And it was manual work. So <clears throat> what story was I getting to? And the cantor didn't, yeah, didn't work. <laughs> I have so many stories in my life now at this juncture. So the cantor, after two sessions, the cantor was a very nice guy because he could have kept getting paid which was not insignificant at that time, the payment he was made every week. He came to my father and he told my father, Mr. Davidowitz, I want to tell you, save your money <laughs> because it wouldn't help. It's really hopeless I could invest <laughs> the next hundred years. And so it was a good thing to learn, you know. Otherwise, I, I might have pursued that career and uh, become a, a hopeful Sinatra or hopeful. Uh, that's not a dream. That's a, a dream that turns into a, a major letdown, even a, a, a nightmare. <laughs> but if you have a dream and within your capacity that God gave you, Everybody can have such a dream. And uh, not only that, the other thing you should have is enough love of yourself, learning to love yourself, that you feel that you deserve to be awarded with happiness every day. And then because you deserve it, do the things that will make you happy. Inevitably, every human being that lives long enough goes through hardships, disappointments, losses, uh, failures. Just about every kind of uh, adversity that depresses you. So don't let that those those events dominate your life. Focus on the good things. Focus on your dreams. Focus on achieving your dreams. Focus on the progress you're making. If you're pursuing something that seems hopeless, truly then pursue a new dream. But that, that makes life exciting and wonderful. And, and also the dreams you have for your family, for your children, for their graduation, for, throughout life you can have fulfillment of dreams that give you joy and pleasure in the midst of uh, the aggravation and the disappointments. And so without further ado, let's get to the aggravation. <laughs> <laughs> I do want to tell you, the book has turned out to be such a success that there's one chairman of the board of a Fortune 100 company said he's given it. First, he, he bought it, got it for himself, and he loved it so much that now it's a, you know, uh, it's more than a habit. It's like a, a built-in family custom of a ritual that once every day in the evening at dinner time, after dinner time, instead of just watching television, and his kids like some television programs, and it's not averse to their watching it. But he read them a page one time. He turned off one of their favorite programs that they were watching with their mother. And they said, Dad, what are you doing? Are you nuts? That's our favorite program. So he put on DVR, and he said, I want you to listen to something that I enjoyed. And he read one page and they liked it a lot. And they started discussing the validity of what that page said and whether it made him feel better 
And since then, he's doing a page every day. But he decided to give it as a gift. He gives out thousands of gifts every year. And he says, he's gotten more compliments for this gift than any other gift he's ever given, including some of the most expensive ones. Because most of the people he deals with have just about everything that's expensive in life and don't need more more gifts that they can get that can gather dust. Or they can use once or twice a year, if ever. But he says they after they get the gift, this gift, unlike other gifts, they forget who who got it for them. They have no reason to to go to that gift and use it during the year. He says he's gotten compliments months after he sent the gifts, saying, last night, Joe, I took out happiness guaranteed, and instead of getting my misery back, I really got rid of some of the misery I was going through. So to encourage you to get this book, because it's, it's done that for people. And I made this offer, and I still make this offer. It's a better offer than you get on any product, on television or any advertisement, which says, buy the product, try the product. And if you don't enjoy it, if you don't appreciate it, if you don't think it's worth many times what you paid for it, or at least it was a good buy, then send it back and we'll give you your money back. Just send us the purchase list. You don't even have to send back the jar or the contents of the jar. So my my offer to my the purchases of my book is I will not only refund your purchase price if you send me your uh, purchase slip with the amount you spent for it and um, and let you keep the book even. So if you want to make a profit, I'll give you double <laughs> your purchase price back. So I don't know how you can have a better deal than that. So go out and get this book. I, I got uh, a nice letter from somebody that listened to last week's program. Well, where was she from? The, you know, we just we just sent it to her. We just took it to the post office. Oh, I don't remember her name. No, I did not look for her name, but it was from a listener. What? A listener? Yeah. Bought a book. Yeah. Yeah. I just brought it to the post office. No, I'm saying what state or city? New Jersey. New Jersey? Yeah. Uh, not that far away. Anyway. She thanked me, and she ordered the book, and I just sent it to her today. But I'm getting a lot of that. I think people want to earn the double the money back. So not only do you get your misery back, but you get double your money right. back. So you get three things. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good. So, Len, why don't you get into the week's um, miseries? Miseries. Yeah. <laughs> now that we've. Unless whatever found, minimal happiness we can get. something yeah, to be unfortunately, happy about. Unfortunately, no. <laughs> you know, I never see anything that makes the front pages. <clears throat> that's really happiness. Not a marriage, not a, not a graduation. Not a, well, that, the problem not a, is... Not a major contribution but to it's like But it's like you say with, the base, with baseball, right? Why God can't do everything. Because they're always going to have some people who are not happy about the outcome and some people who are happy about the outcome in a baseball yeah. game or an election, whatever it may be. No, I'd have... say it's a lot worse than that. You know, I'm a big tennis fan. And at the U.S. Open, which is like the number one or one of the top four tennis events of the year, happens right here in Queens, Um it starts with a hundred and generally about a hundred thirty-two <clears throat> uh, contestants, right. all the top players, because you can't qualify them unless you're a top pro. And uh, 
people win this first round are happy and they get a good, pretty good payment, much more than they get during the year at all the places they fly to. And, you know, if they, if they win the tournament, they get maybe a thousand dollars or something. Of course, then more than that, mm-hmm. they get to the <laughs> place. So just getting into the tournament, even in the first round, probably gives them more than they ever earned before. And then as the, they get to the second round, the, the first, with the, they reach the quarterfinal, then the semifinal, they keep getting more and more money. And then one, two of them get to the finals, and they are elated, you know, to, to have been yeah, made it. One of them's going to lose. One of, to one of the premier events <coughs> of the year that could go down in, in the history book. And then at the end of that, there's one winner. One winner. So out of 132 participants, you have 131 disappointments. Right. Even the ones, <laughs> even the ones that were excited along yeah. the way, if, like I always say, if I were God, you know, if I were God, I would have designed it the other way. I would have had figured out a way to make 131 winners and let one guy get cry and be miserable for all the rest. <laughs> but that's clearly impossible. That's not reality. So uh, that's always going to be the case. Yeah. The one who loses in the finals is so excited that they made it to the finals. But still lost. But they're crying. Still lost, yep. Uh, so here we are. How time flies, you know, we're 96 days away from another election. Seems like just three and a half years ago, there was the last election. <laughs> um, so as always, a lot of interesting things have happened in the last week or so. And since that debate between former President Trump and President Biden, a lot has happened on the presidential running up stage. Um, We're starting to learn now more and more we hear about what was really going on in the White House. And even though President Biden had a reasonably successful State of the Union, we're hearing a lot of talk that he really wasn't doing so great. And so I guess in terms of what's happened, do you think, do you think as some do that his staff and close aides were remiss, you know, in, and in, in disclosing, you know, it's like in, in, in a public company, if you say something wrong, it's material misstatement. But if you don't say something, that's just as bad. That's a material omission, right? So, would you think, would you say that his staff and close aides were, you know, guilty of material omission and not saying what's going on really with the president? I, I don't believe that's true. Because, yes, he, he made a lot of awkward moves. He slipped down a flight of stairs getting off an airplane. They say that he switched from the tall stairs to Air Force One to the lower ones in the back. So they, the, the, the aides did a lot of things like to, as, as detractors say, hide what was going on. Like, you know, they wouldn't have press conferences. They would limit his appointment, his, his appearances after hours and early in the morning. So they would do a bunch of different things to fashion the view. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. Is that right? <clears throat> but my view, as I got older and friends of mine got older, uh, I've seen a lot of that. And these very same people that couldn't remember names or pronounced the wrong names or assert that this was the guy that did it and slipped down steps. I'll tell you one one thing that was amazing. About uh, maybe eight years ago, 10 years ago, the owner of the World Trade Center, Larry Silverstein, 
dropped me a note and it, it said, Morty, don't get dressed standing up because I fell down and broke both, both, both my hips. It's <laughs> kind of funny, but it was good advice because when you get dressed standing up, if you lose your balance, you can do worse than that. If you get dressed, say, in your bathroom and you have a, a bathtub there that's could hit your head. What's it made of? Porcelain. Not, not concrete, but Porcelain. marble or something. Yeah. yeah. People, there's a lot of deaths come from falling. So it, it shows you, you know, and here's a guy who's very bright. He's still building new buildings. And still, so did they have an obligation? They felt unbalanced. He was doing good things. Uh, it, it, a lot of it was exaggerated by his uh, political ad adversaries because <clears throat> Trump <throat> has likewise made, because of his age, many mistakes. He covers them up much better than, than and he doesn't admit to them. So it's, it's, but they didn't have the obligation. And it, it occurs to me one other thing, if you want to be happier, get good friends. A good friend like Larry Silverstein, that contribution, he'll never know that perhaps that's saving my life or saved my life already. So friends do good things for you without necessarily taking credit or seeking credit and so forth. Like one friend, an old friend of mine that I'm very impressed with, uh, who's done good things for so many people. His name is on the hospital, a New York uh, hospital, uh, Ken Langone. His name is painted all over the, the hospital, Ken Langone. And what he's done in terms of the money that he contribute, contributed, including his name, but mostly the fact that he made so many different treatments available and so many services available to so many people that couldn't afford it. Ken Langone is one of my lifetime heroes. And in, in the same light, the most joyful thing in my life in terms of what I did with my money is the money that I gave away. I didn't ever lose any of that money. It was lost for my use, but I started local schools. I, I contributed to major uh, institutions that I attended, Harvard, Yeshiva <clears throat> University. I started uh, graduate colleges for, for uh, specialized careers in medicine, in, in the rabbinate, in the clergy. So there's nothing more gratifying. I get letters every year from students att who attend Mount Sinai Medical School because many years ago, at the instance of the chairman of Goldman Sachs, what was his name again? Very famous guy. Anyway, he asked me to, he was the chairman of Mount Sinai, and he asked me to make this kind of contribution to fund the first year of every needy uh, medical, uh, medical, accepted medical school. And I did it, and I've gotten letters from, from all over the world, from, from Hispanics, to Asians, to African Americans, every kind they get, even from white Americans, and and how much they appreciate what I did, because they said if they couldn't cover that first year, they could have never talk about a investment that pays perpetual dividends. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so 
<clears throat> speaking of things that people say, um, a lot of what we hear from former President Trump requires much unpacking <laughs> and discerning because it's either in riddle form or obfuscated form. So the one thing that he recently said in a rally urging Christians to vote in the next election, Christians, I love Christians, vote in the next election because if you vote in the next election, you'll never have to vote again. So no real explanation of that comment, but as you might imagine, the certainly left-wing media just was in a complete tizzy over that, <laughs> trying to decipher what the meaning of it was. And I want to get your thought on that, but I think no matter what the meaning was, it goes to Donald Trump's brilliance in getting attention, media attention, because whether he consciously thought to say what he said, and I'm not sure he did, because a lot of times he goes off the teleprompter, right. but the result was just brilliant. I mean, it's, we'll talk about this in a minute too, with, with his statement on debating Vice President Harris or not debating her, just these, these firestorms that are created from these statements. So the question that everyone is asking is what did he mean by that? Is it, you take it on its face that you'll never have to vote again because there's not going to be any more elections after four years? Or as some people say, no, no, what he really meant was I'm going to fix all the problems so well that there'll be no need for you to vote for, because everything's going to be just great. Look, my relationship <laughs> with Donald Trump <clears throat> is an intriguing one because for the longest time, <clears throat> I loved him. Anytime he introduced me to somebody, he said, Morty Davis, he even endorsed my, my book, From Hard Knocks to Hot Stocks, praising me effusely, you know. I couldn't write it for myself better than he wrote it. And I loved him for that. But also anytime he, he introduced me, and as you well know, he tends to be rather uh, uh, generous and, and, and especially in the use of language, uh, exaggerating. So he would say, Morty Davis, the biggest guy on Wall Street, the richest guy, the best guy. And, you know, it was very flattering and coming from Donald Trump. I appreciated it. And uh, so I, I loved him. And even though when I went to his office, he showed me all the magazines with his face on the cover of the magazines. Later on, I found out that they were just mock-ups. <laughs> he was on the, on the cover of many. And, and I also was very impressed with what he'd done, what, what he fixed the Central Park ice skating ring in no time at all when a lot of other builders were called in. And his reputation as a builder and specialized buildings uh, well, it was great, so I loved it. But what, when uh, when he when he had the debate with Hillary in 2016 for the uh, presidency that was going to start in 2017, and uh, the interviewer, what do you call him, the host of the moderator, the moderator asked him straight out, would you support whoever wins the election? And he said, of course, as long as I win the election. So right away, 
he tells you he's not so open to a Defeat. The final will, <laughs> the, no, the final will of the people. Right, as long as that. And then that's on January sixth, uh, that was two to twenty nineteen twenty one twenty twenty one twenty twenty one. He has Pence, his vice president, who is probably the most loyal vice president ever, never had. One word that contradicted or said anything, even close to negative, about uh, about Trump, and he wouldn't violate the Constitution at the instance at the advice of his uh, two top assistants, and Trump tried to take the said. This, the election was stolen, even though it turns out, upon uh, you know, intensive review, that not only wasn't it stolen, but Biden won by the largest plurality or margin than any other president in the history. And even now, he says, you know, he's got so many votes, he doesn't need any. You don't have to come out to vote. He, he, he undermines his own voters. So, uh, <clears throat> and the irony is, and my view is, has been and disappointingly, the way he says what he says, that he will be, that this will be. If he gets elected, the last election we ever have, and and he will turn it over to. They won't even have to change any of the stationery, because his son's his other son is Donald Trump, as well, Don Donald Trump Jr. <laughs> so, my view is that. It, Maybe I'm wrong. I hope I'm wrong. My children are very strong supporters of it. They believe he's done good things. So he's created divisiveness hmm. between me and my children. Because <laughs> my children blame me. They said, Dad, how could you change your views? Because the views that we're expressing are the views, the views that you would instill in, in us. So I, I don't have a good answer <laughs> for that. But uh, so when he said yesterday that uh, you don't have to come out to vote anymore, he explained it. What's her name? Uh, who interviewed him? She's a very right wing. Uh, uh, Fox. Ingram? Laura Ingram? Laura Ingram had a long session with him. She's doing another one with him. He didn't invite her. Shortly. Uh, and he said, What I meant was that. Of course, she said, would you turn it over? And he said, well, I turned it over last time, didn't I? <laughs> so, well, of course I would. So why did you say that? Because people are understanding that you say that there won't be any elections anymore. Uh, so he said, well, I meant the, the, the what do you call it, the election? So be so straight and so unquestionable. He's for paper ballots and so forth. And no, all the election should happen on one day. It'll be perfect. So you won't have to. And in that case, I'll be so overwhelmingly elected. 
So I'm saying to my Christian friends, you won't have to vote. Oh, very I won't need your votes because I'll right. be so I wouldn't winning get, in a landslide. I wouldn't <clears throat> ask you to, to not get brains out, and the weather's yeah. bad. You gotta go. But again, it goes. It. I mean, that for, for whatever intentional or unintentional statement, it turned out was brilliant. Just like the next thing that he did was put I don't out. Know if it's brilliant. It's look at because look it reassures. At, but it gets them. It gets them the attention. No, but it reassures the people that they're afraid of them. Well, that it's the, the end of democracy. Well, it's it was brilliant from the point of view of getting attention. It may not have been brilliant. It, it may not have been as br- so brilliant in terms of getting the voters who they always say are going to decide this election. He doesn't need to convince his base to vote for him. His base is going to vote for him. Well, what he well, needs to well, convince well, are people, like well, always, in the middle who are not decided, I independent. Think, I don't think anybody questions his capacity, his abilities, his genius to get attention. So there's not a day when I get up that he hasn't said something that makes for the news that day. And that's that's one of the most interesting and enter- entertaining part of his, <laughs> of his being involved in politics. Because that's not that you think there can't be anything new that's going to happen. And and if you wrote it in a, in, a, in a book fiction, it would be unbelievable. People would say, right. But say, right. But from a political happen. strategy point of view, it may not have been the smartest because the Santa was the smartest. It got it. No, got it was ten. from a attention, attention gather. If that's yeah. your goal, but your goal should be not just attention, but it should be to win voters. So what I'm saying is, he succeeded on attention gathering, but may not have succeeded on voter gathering. Yeah, but that's genius because he doesn't lose any voters by coming up with a policy that they could feel that they could reject. So his policies are subject to whatever you want, you know. It's like the guy, the African American from South Carolina, I think. Tim Scott. What? Tim Scott. Tim Scott was interviewed. He was a, a possible vice president. Yeah, never had a choice, chance. Choice of uh, of Trumps. When he was interviewed, he said, "Would you accept?" They asked Tim Scott, would you accept whoever is elected, whoever, you know, the uh, the college of uh, the electoral college says, uh, one, would you accept that? And he said, of course I would. He said, really? So if if, uh, if Biden won, uh, well, I don't want to deal with hypotheticals, because that's not going to happen. Uh, <laughs> Trump is going to win. So I don't have to deal with that. So if they've got that view, it's genius. What it would be. Another very smart attention gathering statement was the campaign, Trump campaign put out a statement saying the debate that was scheduled with President Biden is off because he's no longer running. And we, at this point, are not committing to a debate with Kamala Harris because she's not the official nominee. Not yet, but she will be. Well, but at the, so, but that's why, so, I mean, presumpt, yeah, of course. Not but weeks, she. Right, but at the time they put out this statement. I, th- I think she is now. But they had, yeah. They had the company. No, well, they haven't had the. They haven't had the vote. No, but I think she. I mean, she has the. She has the delegates. Right. Um, but how smart was that for Trump's on Trump's part? Because it just created again headlines yeah. and talk and news news air over what does this mean? Does yeah. it mean he's not going to debate her? Why wouldn't he debate her? You know, is he? Is he not? Why did he say it? What does it mean? Why wouldn't he want to debate it? Will he? Won't he? 
So it, and and so not you get all that. you get all these people talking about that. Not Even if he has every intention of that. debating her, it was so smart to say, at this point, I'm not going to debate. I don't know if you Ooh, realize. Why not? I don't know if you realize it. He never had as much work as he has now, because his interest in the social network. Right. That's hypothetically that though. I mean, that's trades, not exactly. Trades, well, it trades big numbers. Yeah, well, and his following will buy those shares. I, I don't mean, know why it's less appealing as a market play than Game GameStop or yeah. something, or they have <coughs> no basis other than a big following. So, but I think his share is worth five billion, according to many people. He never had that kind of money. He had assets that had value of more well, than that. This is... but, but he had so much debt against it that he owed that it's questionable whether he even had a billion dollars. So he's turned the presidency into a, a cash machine, an ATM. So based on his statement and what you think, is he going to debate? Kamala Harris, <clears throat> or is he too scared because he knows she's a more effective debater than Joe Biden? Well, he, he made a good point last night. Or will night. he do it? He made a good point last night of why he shouldn't or why he might. He says, there's no reason why I, I should because everybody knows me. They know my, they know my values my my programs i've been there i've done it people don't know her know her and by giving her this exposure i'm just making people more more aware it might useful be useful to do that because maybe once i get them to know what she's really for maybe it'll just like Biden's was killed by his opening statement of the debate. So he said, I'm not sure. I may. I'm thinking about it and so forth. Right. But and again, I, it's it's I believe that it's suspense, right? It's like yeah. the apprentice. It's 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 a yeah. tune in for the, yeah, the reveal. Apprentice, the apprentice is a, a revelation way in advance. Of what he is, yeah. Because everybody in his, in his administration has been fired. Right. Not fired. I think I I was watching Anthony Scaramucci on a show a few days ago. I actually agree with him. He said, "With read the letter, I wrote that. with one hundred percent certainty, he said, Trump will debate. Will do that. Will. He said absolute one hundred percent certainty. Why? Because how could he tell his base, you know, who he's always told, I am the best, smartest, most articulate. How could he tell them, I'm not going to debate a woman who's black and uh, mother's Indian? He can't do that. His base would say, that's the reason they shouldn't debate her. But it's she's like black. it's such a defeat. It's it's, that, a, it's like it's, it's like how could she's he black? Why why would I? But, but why would he run from that? Right? He can't he can't look weak to the, to those people. And well, and, and, and she's such a de minimis com if, opponent. If he decides not to debate her, he will come up with a good story. That why True. should I why should I help her? Right. Nobody knows her. I mean that is a good story. Yeah. But I think I think Anthony Scaramucci is right. We'll see. I, I would love to see them debate. We'll see. I think I I th I agree with him. I think they will. Yeah. He also says he hates ABC, and he doesn't want to see right. them make. I mean that they all may, that money. They may come up with he, some he more said, neutral he said, what do you medium. Great, fair, reasonable. First time I ever heard him say that about C CNN. CNN. Oh, I didn't hear that. He, he actually. That. That the hosts of Jake Tapper and yeah, uh, Dana Bash. They were reasonable. They, 
Why? Because it turned out well. Yeah, well, that's, that's usually the basis for the uh, determination. Um, let's turn to running mates. It, it seems the thing that people are questioning now is why didn't J.D. Vance get vetted as well as he might have been? <laughs> and you know that the Harris team is going extra lengths to vet whoever they're going to recommend. But um, things, as they, as you said before, always come out of the woodwork from years ago that they probably, it, was, it wasn't like that interview with Tucker Carlson in 2021, whenever that came out, wasn't, was buried somewhere where no one could have found it. It was right there. I guess no one looked for it. So not quite the deepest due it's diligence. It's interesting but... that you bring it up just now. Tucker Carlson sort of disappeared from television. He had maybe some niche exposure. Some, I don't even know what station he was on. I think he has and his own channel. Suddenly he appeared with Trump in the last couple of uh, major appearances. I and, think the one where and he was, was at the debate too. Was he at? The, I mean, not the debate, the RNC. Yeah, he was at the RNC. Was he at the one where Trump was shot or no? I don't think he was at that rally. That was a r rally way out in rural Pennsylvania. But Trump's strongest two guys have turned out to be Sean Hannity, who he used as a consultant and a so pro Trump. Yeah. Well. I mean, who on Fox isn't? Laura Ingram is very pro. Maria Bartiromo is very pro. They're all, they all yeah, softball. Which is nine passed away. He was very pro. He never was that one-sided. With the deep. Oh, Lou Dobbs, yeah. Yeah. Lou Dobbs. But, uh, all, all great spokesmen. At least for that crowd. But you we were talking back. before, you don't you didn't think that saying the country's run by childless cat ladies was such a uh, as as the Democrats are saying now, weird, because now they're trying to label JD Vance as weird, um, that that was such a weird thing to say. I think that something like Trump says so many things that on any given day, people could be so critical of what he says. It's the same with Vince. What he said couldn't be more insulting, first of all, to all the cat owners. <laughs> <laughs> and there's lots of them. Out he did there. apologize to the cats, yeah. yeah. And, and also, you know, it, it's not true. But in some respect, it is true, because there's nobody... No woman that owns a cat that's running has been ever held a position of running this country. But there's some truth in what he's trying to imply that we need people to return to Christianity, to religion, to, to belief in tradition, American values. That's, that's his point he said it in a way but but you can believe in traditional values without having to have kids i mean one of the what he singled out pete Buttigieg as someone who is a childless cat lady and why that's why why someone it's like more, that should uh, whatever his name pete Buttigieg. i can never pronounce Buttigieg. it Buttigieg. Buttigieg. yeah secretary of transportation doesn't, now doesn't he have some kids in it? I think they adopted, yeah. So, but, yes, kids. So that's the wrong example. He's saying, but I don't think that was his number, point. It was he's saying something interesting because all these people that say global warming, as Trump says, total waste of money. It's a gimmick of the the rich and the and the politicians to win other voters. It's not threatening. There are a bunch of scientists that say 
it's all about, right? Mm -hmm. And he said that people, which I say about my my feeling about global warming, I say even if there's a, only the slightest chance that it's right, what these scientists say that we're destroying the earth, that it won't be inhab inhabitable uh, if we go, if we continue on the route we're on. And it's going to be everything in nature is going to be destroyed. So they said it's a total waste of value of, of, of our efforts, of our money, and the way to deal with that is drill more, drill baby drill. Because if we do that, there won't be any global warming. Oil will go to everything, it'll stop inflation. And, you know, and I'm saying, even if they're wrong, but if, there, if there's a chance they're 10% right, then I want us to spend the money on that, which I think is, is important as a new offense weapon that we develop. I'm not talking about defense, but offense weapon that we develop, because we have enough offense weapons. And, and there's always the fear that the Russians or the Chinese will their pairs up with spending enormous amount. So if somebody with a child cares about the future more than somebody whose life is begins and ends with its own. Why? Because how do you know? I mean, that's the that's, that's but that's just, then that they're life. just. But wh who, I see their lifetime behavior. But why does they, why does it have spend, to be? They spend their time. That's a so that's a generalization. Visiting, I don't think visiting different countries. But how many how many people without kids are better? more concerned with the future of the world than there are people with kids who are just bad parents. I mean, I don't think kids or not kids I, makes what you're saying true. I agree with what you're saying. People should have a, a, a care for the future of the world. Whether you have kids or not, you should care I, for I the future of the life. world. And just life. because you have kids doesn't mean you're going to be any more caring because there's lots of bad parents out there. I go by my feelings. <laughs> Which is, I want to make it a better world for my kids. Right. Well, if you I want to make a better world for no, all for if, all if people, all future generations. If I weren't married and with kids, I would probably take a lot of the money that I earned and visit every country in the world and be traveling. Around but what? That's you. Well, why does that have to be saying, everyone else without kids? Right, I'm that's project, why it was an unfair I'm generalization. Project, I'm projecting. Right, but that's why it's unfair to make that generalization. I don't think it's unfair. No, because I do believe. I think what he I should, do believe people he, with kids. But the what? But you should. The, what what, have what he a should have said of, in the future of the world. I think it's 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 a function of the person, not whether or not they have kids or not. Because I think you can care about the future with having kids. You can care about the future without having kids. It's not the kids that's, don't. That's it's the person true. who you true. are, that's and so true of everything we've said today, you could have the best friend. Right. But, have but that's best, why to generalize no, it I, on whether you have kids or not, I don't think I is gave, fair. I gave Larry Silverstein and Ken Langone so much credit because their behavior is unique. Even your right. best friend, right? That's why it's the litmus the test out, is not kids. Take, it's take it's behavior. Out doesn't take the time out. So you're right. There's people that have no kids right. and then invest in the future right. of the world. It's behavior. It's not a litmus test. It's not kids. Now, he might have meant that, but he certainly didn't do a good job articulating it because it's, it's getting him into a twist, a whole no, twisted and thing. Even, and even the idea that we we got away, implicit in what he said, is we got away from religion. The values that made this country great, he feels, was religion and, and spending right. time with family, I mean, Chuck, sp spending time with family right. and friends. Right. That's that's the issue, not whether or not, because you can spend time with family, with 
family and people and and, and without yeah. being without having to have kids. But Chuck Schumer said this is one of the best things Trump ever did for the Democrats was not was choose J.D. Vance. <laughs> Probably. I mean, it certainly, it that certainly didn't. It, you know, I think, I think what we're going to see on Kamala Harris's choice is a more traditional strategic pick, because Trump certainly didn't do that. He didn't uh, on another white MAGA guy from Ohio doesn't really add a lot to broaden his appeal, <clears throat> and again. This election will be decided by that moderate swing, you know, independent, undecided voter. The people who go to his rallies are voting for Trump. The people who, you know, are protesting against the rallies are voting for Harris. You're not going to change those two groups. There's always Trumpers and there's never Trumpers. It's the middle. So. And so that's the group that both candidates need to court and that's generally the conventional wisdom is to court that middle group you try to broaden your ticket you try to you know say things that might appeal and to more people than just keep doubling and doubling down on you know, things that your base likes to hear like uh <laughs> You know, I don't like the, just uh, <coughs> last week, Trump <coughs> was at a rally talking about uh, how he's criticized for mispronouncing the vice president's name and, you know, says, oh, I don't care how it's pronounced. I mean, you know, to, to some people that's a turnoff <laughs> and, you know, might have been better to try to moderate that in order to, you know, appeal to a broader base, like he, his nomination speech started off saying, I'm going to be the president for all Americans, not just half, because there's no victory in being president to half. And then it quickly changed to more of a traditional <laughs> rally type of discussion. But, um, you know, that's... Well, so people yeah. really don't know very much about... Uh, Kamala Harris because number one she's not the only one but the way she climbed the political ladder so fast was right after she got out of the college she was an attractive young lady she sh shacked up with Willie Brown who was a powerhouse in San Francisco I know something about that because I befriended Willie Brown. He was sharp as a tack. He dressed beautifully. So she had a right to do that. But he promoted her and he appointed her attorney general before she had any track record. And that launched her. And, and people don't know this, but both her parents were major communists. Her father taught communism at, at uh, you know, the university you went to. Uh, Stanford? Stanford. And the mother likewise. And they were very into that segment. So that doesn't mean she's bad. But you know, if people know more about that, well, that's you know that surprised me that nobody ever brought up about uh, and, and they do research that about Biden being was running for president years ago, and they thought he'd never become plagiarized his speech. That. He plagiarized, yeah. and right after that, yeah. he went from being a, yep. a viable candidate. Even a promise, <clears throat> but in the, in the eight years, or ten years right. since, uh, well, I mean, you then. bring up a good point about what 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 should be the right, right. way. This is a milestone. Yeah, uh, Len Carter said I brought up 
a good point. In what what Mark should be diamond. the way Mark to diamond. pick yeah. candidates? You know, because a lot of people when they say why they don't like Trump, they'll say, "I don't like the way he talks about this, or he, what he said about women, or this access Hollywood." And you know, supporters will say, "Well, I don't like that either," but his policies are great. People say, "Well." Kamala Harris slept her way to her higher positions. Shows how smart she is. <laughs> <laughs> but, but they use the weapons. Yeah. But the policy. But you know, they may not approve of that. But they may like the policies that she espouses, whether it's um, Medicare for all, Green New Deal, whatever that may be. So we're actually out of time today. But I think that's a good. Set up for our next, maybe our next discussion, where we can talk about policy instead of s less so about crazy things that candidates say, or in uh, or inflammatory things that candidates say. But we can put that aside and have a more policy discussion on which which policies do we like and not like about. The different candidates, because which is hard to do. People, you know, people are more, you know, personal and emotionally driven when it comes to why they like or don't like. I don't like her laugh. You know, I mean, do you not vote for someone because she laughs yeah, weird? I mean, not, okay. I mean, if that's if that's your criteria, then don't vote for not, Kamala Harris. Trump, but Trump said they trained her not to, to laugh. Not to laugh. You know. So I mean, I, I found that a turn off. Yes, all she did is giggled and giggled. Right, I, but I didn't know she could make. Could make so a, let's let's a move statement. beyond. Let's move beyond. You know, personal attributes, whether it's you, uh, you, 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 how to pronounce your name, or whether you giggle, or whether you, uh, you know, say things that that uh, may offend women, and let's move on to policy because a lot of I know that a lot of uh, political well a lot of people do base their well, voting on personality you know I would argue it's better for the country to base your vote on a policy yeah, but, but so and then we can we can discuss again, that you have to appreciate the genius of Trump because every, every, since I'm a kid, and I, I believe before that, a long time, everybody who ran for president had a printed platform that included a list of all their policies with respect to the major issues. He doesn't put it down on paper. So he says he's going to beat inflation. How? What's the policy? He doesn't say. Well, he does. Yeah, how? He's going to cut taxes, right? Increase tariffs yeah, but he doesn't and, say and drill. Uh, how that's going to work, he doesn't no, say. But does that's it, what. How does cut, cutting taxes reduce inflation? Maybe, maybe it adds inflation. It might. It I mean, raising more, tariffs may very it, well add inflation it puts too. More, what? Raising tariffs may add inflation too. Probably will. That may. Yeah. Absolutely will. Right, so. No, so I'm saying he has a policy cutting <clears throat> taxes, which is who's against that? But he doesn't say I'm going to cut it for the people, the top one percent. <clears throat> well, he would say he would say raising tariffs will protect American jobs, which will give Americans money to spend, and that will be good for the economy and. What what makes the economy grow will will reduce inflationary. Yeah, but pressures. economists point out that no president has ever produced more jobs than Biden. So I'm saying by by leaving these things very generalized instead of having and they'll say about uh, Jews voting for Biden or the Democrats. They gotta be crazy. They gotta, and and you know, implying that 
he'll vote for things that make Jews happy. So, you know, the question is, <clears throat> who's going to get the vice president? I well, think the we, best qualified. We may know. We better. may know the next time we have. We next time we may meet. We yeah. may. We may have an answer to that. We'll see. The most, <laughs> I think the most qualified. So, if that's not reason to tune in to next week's show, I don't know what is. If you went based on on the facts out there, and uh, and the resumes and so forth, you'd have to say that Shapiro. Is should be his number our number yeah. one choice. Yeah, because Pennsylvania yep. is critical. Yep, and he's, he's very a popular. popular yep. There. yep, and also uh, maybe he brings in some Jewish folk. But more important is that uh, that he won by a bigger margin in Pennsylvania yeah. than Biden. So if you want to <clears> just on that basis. But other people say, well, an African American and, and a Jew on the same ticket would not appeal to the to the independents that haven't made up their mind yet. In other words, some of the racists that might have vote. Although I don't know how many racists are gonna vote for except black racists maybe are gonna vote for because uh, she's definitely inspired the uh, and the blacks are not so African Americans are not enthusiastic about Shapiro if I had a guess I would bet astronaut. on Kelly astronaut yeah the astronaut from Arizona. Yep. And also maybe Walls <clears throat> by the way. All right. Did you say Walls? Governor Walls? No. Charming, smiling is another one. Yeah, three or four. All right. So well, if Shapiro gets it, I'd be surprised. All right. I, I'm not sure I even want him to get it. We will see. I don't need I don't need the Jews to get blamed for anything. We will return in a week. Thank you for the time as usual. Thank you for joining me and not being too, so critical. <laughs> Wait till we get to policy. <laughs> anyway, thank you all, my beloved cohorts who join me every week. Thank you for being part of this week's program and I look forward to being with you next week again and every week thereafter as long as I'm still waking up and breathing and unto eternity at least to 120 years and then I'll negotiate for more so I hope I wish for you every one of you most importantly good health to you and your children and all your loved ones. Outstanding success in all that you pursue in fulfilling all your dreams. And finally, genuine quality, inspirational happiness unto eternity, forever, always. God bless you. Have a great week. Have a great every, every day of your life. Bye.